Bomb attacks on American forces. Suspected collaborators murdered. The struggle to root out former party members. These stories may seem ripped from today's headlines, but they're not. This is Germany in the months and years following World War II. For decades, little was known about this post-war period, the Nazi resistance movement, and the guerrilla fighters who tried to resurrect the Third Reich. Until now. On the night of August 9, 1946, 15 months after Germany surrendered to Allied forces, a powerful bomb blast rocks a local church run by a noted anti-Nazi priest. A month later, the U.S. constabulary post is stoned. Then a grenade attack targets a U.S. soldier. Across the city, Swastikas and posters spring up, declaring that the Nuremberg trial verdicts are not justice, but homicide. Throughout Germany, groups of Nazi loyalists plot to overthrow the occupation forces. In Stuttgart, one underground band of resistors is led by 23-year-old former SS soldier Siegfried Kabus. Kabus and the young guys around him, they were kind of desperados. They didn't find their place in the new society. And so they tried to, to find their place by attacking the Allied forces. In October 1946, Kabus and his gang step up their attacks by targeting several Spruch Cameron buildings, like this one sites of the increasingly unpopular Allied-sponsored denazification trials. It was really regarded as a major provocation directed against the uh, Allied occupation forces, and it was uh, also directed against the process of denazification. Newspapers began comparing the bombings with those in the late 1920s that helped pave the way for the rise of the Nazi party. A series of raids and house-to-house -house searches results in the arrest of 70 individuals, but not the bombers. German and American investigators desperately want to find the mysterious attackers. Who are they? What do they want? And most of all, how can they be stopped before more people rally behind their cause? The origins of the Nazi resistance movement began during the final months of the war, when the German leadership desperately sought any way to prevent their inevitable defeat. In September 1944, the political and military situation in Germany looked bleak. Allied and Soviet forces were steadily advancing. It seemed only a matter of time before they would be on German soil. The survival of Adolf Hitler's Nazi party and its celebrated thousand-year Third Reich was in serious jeopardy. In a final desperate strategy to bolster his beleaguered conventional forces, German SS commander Heinrich Himmler ordered the formation of a guerrilla fighting force. Its purpose was to assist the army by infiltrating behind Western Allied and Soviet front lines. Then, like human U-boats, they would attack supply lines, fuel depots, and other targets of opportunity. What they would do is they would slow the enemy advance up. And as they slowed the enemy advance up, this would give Germany time to pursue other kinds of options. Germany would have some time to negotiate with the Allies. Germany would have time to develop its wonder weapons. They might not actually win the war anymore, but they might come out with a relatively even settlement at the end of the war. Himmler assigned command of this new secret force to SS General Hans Preutzmann. His background, fighting Soviet partisans along Germany's eastern front, made him the perfect candidate. 
Prutzman was a pretty brutal character. He'd actually been uh, SS police commander in Ukraine and South Russia. On top of that, during their German retreat from Russia, the Germans had tried to set up some settler colonies made up of uh, ethnic Germans who were supposed to defend the frontier against the Russians. He had played a role in that. One of those settlements, incidentally, was called Verwolf, codenamed Verwolf. Werewolf was also the codename Preutzmann gave to his new command of Nazi guerrillas. For Germans living in the 1940s, the name Werewolf had a powerful resonance. The werewolf is a mythological beast from the Middle Ages who had come at night into people's homes to kill them. In addition to that, Adolf Hitler favored the word wolf. His dog was named Wolf. The wolf was a magic word to him, and the werewolf was a symbol from earlier times that would serve to haunt the enemies. To keep the werewolf organization functioning during any communications disruption with Berlin, Preutzmann decentralized command in favor of more independent, regionally controlled groups. Across Germany, local Nazi and police units attracted recruits with promises of an exciting new mission, SS rank, and an increased salary. It's estimated that up to 5,000 werewolves eventually enlisted. They consisted largely of discharged older soldiers, non-essential industrial workers, and especially Hitler Youth. There was an assumption in 1945 that Hitler Youth were the true Nazis, that they'd grown up under the uh, Third Reich. They were fully imbued with the ideology that they would fight fanatically. Erich Lost was 18 years old and a captain in the Hitler Youth. In 1945, he enthusiastically joined the Nazi guerrilla werewolves. Today, he is one of the few surviving members. They were telling us there was this wonder weapon, and they were not quite done with it, but we had to wait a while for it. I believed this. In an unusual policy for the times, the werewolves also accepted women. They accounted for up to 15% of the recruits. Because of their secretive nature, werewolf groups often trained in remote locations, such as at this large fortress in the Rhineland. Training consisted of a shortened version given to the typical infantrymen, including orienteering, marching, and riflery. We had what infantrymen had for that time. We had a machine gun a Panzerfaust, and we also had mines, so we could blow things up. Recruits received extensive lessons in espionage and sabotage methods. They would show werewolves how to use this by blowing up tree stumps and things like that, and by giving them hands-on training in how to use these explosives. And then these troops were expected to use these explosives in much more aggressive fashion once they'd been deployed behind Allied lines. During this part of the training, many werewolves became disenchanted. Fighting behind enemy lines while wearing civilian clothes was illegal under the international rules of military engagement. If they were caught, they could be shot. But for true believers in the Nazi cause, nothing would stand in their way, as the Allies were about to find out in the first German city they would occupy. When the Allies pushed into Germany beginning in the fall of 1944, the Nazi guerrilla resistance force launched desperate, unconventional attacks. Werewolf teams of up to six people infiltrated behind enemy lines by traveling through forests at night. They often buried themselves in pre-built bunkers, allowing enemy troops to bypass their position. When the coast was clear, they would emerge to conduct ambushes. It was planned that the Americans would come over our way and we would not be detected. And then we would be able to stop them. 
by killing them, creating confusion, cutting off their supplies, shooting them in the cover of night. Sniping, wire cutting, and small explosives cause the most havoc. Another effective tactic involved the use of landmines. The Allies would oftentimes not check the roads that they were already rolling along because they'd already been checked for mines. So if uh, someone came out from the woods and, and put a mine under a road, then that could prove to be a real problem for the Allies. The vehicle could run over it and have an explosion. Werewolves were also given orders to kill anyone collaborating with the Allies. It's believed they murdered scores, if not hundreds of civilians, by the war's end. One of their most successful operations occurred in Aachen, a city located along Germany's western border with Holland and Belgium. The American forces captured Aachen on October 21, 1944. It would be the first German city to be occupied. The Americans immediately recruited non-Nazis to form a new local administration and to restart essential services to the city's remaining residents. This new German provisional government became a symbolic success for the Allies and a major embarrassment to the Nazi leaders in Berlin. It was devastating for them. The German government called the new regime of Aachen traitors. And Joseph Goebbels said upon their return, they will hang the traitors on every tree in Aachen. Heinrich Himmler ordered his werewolf guerrillas to assassinate the new mayor. He intended this to be a clear message to any other potential collaborators. In March 1945, two months before Germany surrendered, a five-man, one-woman team parachuted behind the Allied lines into Belgium. They then crossed overland towards Aachen, killing a border guard in the process. Late the next evening, they finally arrived here, at the home of Aachen's new mayor, Franz Oppenhoff. SS soldiers came to Oppenhoff's house, knocked on the door, and the maid opened. They claimed to be crashed German pilots and asked for some food. The maid went into the house, called the mayor, and was told by him to prepare some sandwiches for them. The mayor then went to the door by himself to greet the pilots when one soldier, kneeling down, shot him in the left side of the head. Oppenhoff's murder was a major propaganda victory for the Nazis. A replacement was hard to find since everybody thought he would be killed after being elected as the mayor. Everybody was frightened by the thought. All 5,000 people in the city. In the weeks following Oppenhoff's murder, six other small town mayors were assassinated. The werewolves were no longer a Nazi secret. Instead, their newfound mystique was making headlines across Germany and in the United States. The murderous reprisals by Nazi guerrillas proved to be only the first indication of the violent final days of the Third Reich. The brutal Nazi regime would stop at nothing to ensure its long-term survival. In Berlin, Nazi propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels railed against those Germans he felt were not doing enough to protect the Third Reich. In an effort to rally the people, Goebbels brought to the airwaves on April 1st, 1945, a novel new program, Radio Werewolf. For one hour each night, announcers urged every German to take up arms against the enemy. They read aloud instructions in how to use weapons such as the Panzerfaust, a type of rocket-propelled grenade strong enough to knock out a tank. Goebbels also used Radio Werewolf to announce the names of the civilians that had been killed for collaborating with the enemy. 
was meant to intimidate people and, and make them aware of the fact that Nazi justice had a long arm and that German killers could still come after them, even after the Allies had arrived. Radio Werewolf made clear to American forces that Nazi guerrillas were operating across Germany. Their potential caused a tremendous amount of concern. The Allies were very, very worried about this at the very beginning because they didn't know what kind of dimensions this would eventually assume. They make it clear to Germans that any German caught fighting outside the rules of war, engaged in, in, in irregular combat, would become subject or could become subject to a summary punishment. In addition to these executions, the American 12th Army instituted a ban on any public reports mentioning suspected guerrilla activities. They thought that uh, the more they talked about it, the uh, more credit the werewolves would get for various actions, and that by talking about the werewolves, they were actually be encouraging the werewolves. With the war now in its final, desperate stage, Nazi guerrillas increased their attacks against their fellow Germans. Across the country, numerous suspected defeatists or alleged anti-Nazis were shot. The mayor of the town of Breitheimer and a few other responsible people from that town, they wanted to put out the white flags uh, when the Allied troops were coming nearer, but they were arrested by SS soldiers. And they were hanged and their corpses were guarded by Hitler Jugend boys. One of the most brutal werewolf rampages occurred in the Bavarian city of Pensburg. The coal mining town had never fallen under the spell of Hitler and the Nazis. And as the Allied forces approached, Pensburg citizens looked forward to the end of the war. It was a Saturday. It was a beautiful day and we were waiting to see the American troops. And then suddenly, it went bad. Anti-Nazi rebels seized a couple of radio transmitters and broadcast a general appeal for an uprising. And the local Nazi party chief, he sent then a reprisal squad out to Pensburg to deal out uh, death and destruction. Two groups of soldiers and guerrillas drove into Pensburg. The soldiers went to the mayor's office and ordered him to destroy the town's coal mine. The mayor refused. He and six of his associates were then arrested and taken to the edge of town. In this spot, the seven people, one after the other, were tied up to the trees and then shot by the Wehrmacht soldiers. On the other side of town, a werewolf group rounded up suspected anti-Nazis and hung them from trees. Here are the trees that some of the people were hanged from. You can imagine 40 years ago, people hanging from these trees, their eyes staring out. There were so many there. You could only feel anger and run away. By the time the werewolves snuck out of town under the cover of darkness, 14 men and two women had been executed. And I, knew all the, I knew all the people that lost their lives that night. The woman who taught swimming. One of the men was an instructor in the gymnastic club. They were fine, upstanding people. They never did anything bad to anyone. They fought for the town. No one saw this coming, and no one wanted this to happen. The brutal guerrilla activity could not stop the Allied advance. Every day brought American and Russian forces closer to Berlin. On April 30, 1945, Adolf Hitler committed suicide. Seven days later, General Alfred Jodl met with Allied commanders and signed Germany's unconditional surrender. Hitler's successor, Admiral Karl Dönitz, announced that all Nazi guerrilla and werewolf activity should cease. But many Nazi loyalists refused to comply. Instead, small bands of party members, guerrilla werewolves, and soldiers secretly made plans to rekindle the Third Reich.
additional films inside Berlin, photographed on 9th May just as the unconditional surrender terms were being ratified in the German capital, the scenes show the emptiness and desolation of this once largest city on the continent. The Reichstag is bomb scarred, hardly a landmark escaped being hit during the Allied air attacks. Numerous officers of the German High Command and the interim administration are arrested as prisoners of war on 23rd May. Among the more prominent Nazis seized under the Supreme Headquarters Directive are Admiral Dönitz, Colonel General Gustav Jodl, and Albert Speer, Minister of Economics and Production. The same day at Luneburg, Germany, Heinrich Himmler also ends his life by taking poison. British troops captured the SS chief while trying to escape, wearing a disguise and carrying false papers. Himmler died by crushing and swallowing the contents of a small vial of poison which he had concealed in his mouth. In the wake of its unconditional surrender on May 7, 1945, Germany lay vanquished. Millions had died. Those that survived had suffered terribly during the conflict, both in combat and on the home front. Intensive Allied bombing raids and the ground battle for Germany had forced millions of Germans from their homes. People were glad it's over, but the question was, what, what now? So how can we go on living with our past and what will the Allies uh, do with Germany? On June 5th, 1945, the Allies announced they would govern Germany through four occupation zones, one for each of the four powers, the Soviet Union, Britain, the United States, and France. Most Germans accepted the occupation However, many former party officials and fanatical Nazis refused Admiral Karl Dönitz's order to surrender. Himmler had given an instruction earlier in 1945 uh, where he suggested that any German commander who uh, wanted to stop the fight should automatically be removed from command and that his uh, instructions were not valid. Or some werewolves then rationalized this by saying, well, Dönitz's uh, commands are not really valid because he wants to cease the fight, so we don't really have to listen to him. Between April 1945 and December 1948, a period of over three years, numerous resistance groups attacked occupation forces. This secret map was published in January 1946 by the United States Counterintelligence Branch. It detailed over 500 criminal acts perpetrated in only one three-month period, including looting, rioting, sabotage, as well as 69 assaults on U.S. personnel. Resistance groups sometimes attack the Allies using plastic explosives fitted with timing devices. That happened in a couple of different cases where headquarters were blown up after the Allies had arrived. There was one case where a schoolhouse was blown up but luckily for the Allies, they'd already evacuated it by the time the bomb went off. Another deadly tactic involved using specially designed explosive coal. A piece of this would be mixed in with real coal in the hope that an Allied soldier would toss the fake fuel into a boiler, causing an explosion. On the Eastern Front, one especially diabolical method of sabotage involved leaving behind poison-filled bottles disguised as alcohol. They were hoping the troops would be doing a lot of drinking when they got to Germany and that they could uh, lay low some of these people with poison liquor. And the approved method for that, which had been developed by this uh, Gestapo lab in Berlin, was to put methane in liquor. The effect was a little bit delayed, and yet it could be deadly or it could hurt people very, very badly. Another serious concern of the Allies was the tremendous number of weapons still in the hands of Germans. In December of 1945, seven months after the war, 1,000 weapons possession charges were filed. Many of these involved teenagers and young boys. Thousands were rounded up and kept in makeshift camps. In an effort to crack down on any resistance, the American military responded with harsh measures.
disobedience to our orders results in immediate punishment. The death sentence is meted out for armed resistance to the Allied forces, for acting in defiance of terms imposed by the Allies, for falsely pretending to be a member of the Allied forces. The Americans instituted these tough measures both to crush any armed resistance and to protect the occupying forces. While the Americans used the firing squad to punish guerrillas, the British employed the traditional German method of execution, beheading. After moving into Germany, Allied forces instituted the controversial use of mass reprisals. These served to prevent resistance, though they violated the Geneva Convention that prohibited occupying powers from reprisals against the people when they'd been attacked by individuals or small groups. In one particular town, an Allied soldier was shot by a, by a German sniper, a Hitler Youth sniper, and they uh, then shot 13 German soldiers in reprisal. There was another town where they moved into in the Hartz Mountains, and there was a shooting as well, and they lost a soldier, and they pulled out of, the, out of that town, and they pulled to the outskirts and shelled it all night, and then moved back in the next day. The French forces certainly had no love lost for the Nazis. They often used harsh measures to quell any German guerrilla activity. The French there encountered quite a bit of resistance in the move into Freudenstadt, mostly from scattered soldiers, but also from snipers who weren't clothed in military uniforms and werewolves. And so they enthusiastically uh, shelled the city, at the very least. They felt that there were werewolves also operating at the fringe of the town, and so they arrested the entire male population. And they, they kept them incarcerated for a couple of days with no food and water. The French occupation was also marred by its alleged brutal treatment of many German women. There were a lot of cases of, of violation and rape for many years who did not talk about it publicly, but uh, in the last years it uh, has come up again. But the Soviets were the most vicious when it came to punishing guerrillas. Their impulse was to simply kill anyone remotely suspected of resistance. In the German town of Königsberg, the Soviets responded to the killing of one of their soldiers by rounding up 200 young German men and shooting them. The Soviets had special units, NKVD units, that were deployed to do this, that performed this particular function, to track down guerrillas and uh, overrun them and kill them. While the Allies tried to stop any guerrillas, they also faced another problem, dealing with POWs. Following the war, hundreds of thousands of former soldiers and Nazi party members were held in POW camps. While most were set free to help rebuild the country, thousands of officers and members of the Nazi party remained imprisoned. Their fate would be a trial for war crimes. Elsewhere, every adult German citizen was subjected to an intense new program to uncover any involvement with Hitler's Third Reich. This massive Nazi eradication effort would bring with it a new form of resistance. During the first winter after the war, German public opinion began to harden against the Allied occupiers. Among the biggest complaints were food and fuel shortages, runaway unemployment, and the requisitioning of housing by Allied forces. Scattered Nazi loyalists sought support and sympathy among unhappy Germans through posters, leaflets, and anti-occupation graffiti. Homes of suspected collaborators were marked with the dreaded Wolfsangel. Werewolves had a reputation of leaving calling cards at crime scenes as a warning to others. They indicated to a lot of people that maybe we can't do these things right now, but we'll do them when the Allies go home. The Allies aren't going to be here forever. To prevent any reoccurrence of German fascism, the Allies began a program to denazify Germany and its former territories. It was a policy designed to root out and purge all former party members from positions of power. 
Because the declared war aim of the United Nations is to stamp out both Nazism and militarism in Germany, military government has one basic rule. Don't do business with the Nazis. Further, there is to be no fraternization between our men and the Germans, for we must not forget what the Germans have done to the civilized world. Naturally, once the Germans realized that their war was lost, no German knew anything about concentration camp atrocities, religious persecutions, ill treatment of prisoners of war, and no one admitted ever having been a member of the Nazi party. But working with the counterintelligence corps, military government weeded out the Nazis as fast as they could. It's a tough job, for we're dealing with people trained in treachery. In the first year of occupation, the Allies imprisoned over 200,000 former Nazis. Over 100,000 were eventually indicted. Military officers, government officials, industrialists, bankers, people who uh, composed the elite of German society during the Nazi years found themselves in prison. During denazification, the Allies confronted a new passive form of resistance. The most important part of resistance was trying to, to fool the Allied troops in respect of your own responsibility for national socialist crime. Resistance to the occupation took the form of a more quiet kind of opposition. Uh, that is, of attempting, for example, in universities or industries to uh, protect colleagues and not to reveal the truth about who had done what in the past. Captain James Hudson was an OSS officer responsible for interviewing suspected Nazis. Of course, the only way you can do this in, in interrogation is to have a whole series of subordinates and people are associated together. And we would interview them separately. And in doing so, uh, we would normally catch the errors. And uh, if we found any that were, in, uh, uh, in our opinion, uh, dangerous to us, uh, we would uh, pass them on to CIC or to other headquarters. Military tribunals were set up across Germany for accused Nazi war criminals. The most famous were the Nuremberg trials, which began in November 1945. Here, 22 members of the Nazi top leadership were put on trial. The charges were conspiracy to wage an aggressive war, the committing of war crimes, and crimes against humanity. Women and children have died thus, murdered in cold blood. What right has any man to mercy who has played a part, however indirectly, in such a crime? The trials lasted 11 months. Of the 22 defendants, a total of 11 were sentenced to death. Three were acquitted, and the rest received prison terms. Ten men were hanged in November 1946. Hermann Goering cheated the hangman's noose by swallowing a cyanide pill just hours before his execution. Denazification, however, did not seek merely to punish the leadership of the Nazi regime, but to purge all elements of National Socialism from public life. Every German living in the American sector was required to fill out a detailed questionnaire. Suspect individuals were then brought before Spruchkammerns, or citizen councils. These were held in buildings like this one throughout Germany. In 1946, the responsibility for denazification was given to the German authorities. And from then on, the Spruchkammer became the central institution of denazification. And so the Spruchkammer decided whether there should be a trial or whether this a person could be regarded as unbelasted, which means unguilty. The German public had mixed feelings over the denazification trials. Most Germans complained that their methods of judgment were flawed. The problem was how to identify 
every people and how to find out what they were guilty for exactly. So the problem was that reality was more or less like a picture with, with many different colors and shades of gray. Beginning in August 1947, the denazification trials became the focus of the Nazi guerrilla movement. More than two years after the war, bomb and arson attacks struck targets in Munich and Nuremberg. In Stuttgart, 23-year-old former SS soldier Siegfried Kabus led a group of Nazi revivalists on a terror campaign aimed at undermining the American occupation. Five bombs and a grenade attack rocked the city out of its post-war slumber. Though damage was light, American and German officials feared a resurgence in Nazi support. But instead of rallying behind Kabus, the Germans did just the opposite. Organized protests were formed against the bombings. In Stuttgart, 77,000 workers walked off the job for 15 minutes. It was really amazing how um, people immediately reacted and um, tried to organize demonstrations against these National Socialist guerrilla uh, guys. In November, authorities finally captured Kabus and his gang. A trial in January found them guilty and sentenced Kabus to death. The capture of Kabus ended the last gasp of the Nazi guerrilla movement. Most Germans had seen enough fighting and killing during the war. They had no interest in returning to the past. The level of death in the German armed forces and in German society between 1943 and 1945 staggers the imagination. The notion that there was uh, some plan for resistance ignores uh, the much more important fact that uh, thousands and thousands of German soldiers and civilians were dying every day in the last months of the war, and there was no will to continue the resistance. The desperate effort to resist occupation had lasted for more than two years. Over 40 American soldiers were killed. But in the end, all efforts to revive the Nazi party failed. In the spring of 1947, nearly two years after the end of World War II, the German economy remained mired in chaos. Only the black market trade seemed to be thriving. In some places, jewelry, cigarettes, and chocolate became the currency of choice. 1947 was also a time of increased tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union. As the Cold War heated up, Germany's continued economic and social problems became a serious concern to officials in Washington. Many British and Americans felt that the Russians were right. Let the Germans lie in their ashes. But the future stared at the conquerors. The democracies had no alternatives. Unless Germany was taught democracy, it would learn communism. Another struggle, the struggle to win the mind of a country, had begun. The United States government concluded that, the, that a policy focused primarily on punishment and judicial reckoning was not sufficient and that instead the United States had to focus more to economic reconstruction. In the hopes of rebuilding Germany, on June 5th, 1947, Secretary of State George C. Marshall outlined his economic recovery program. The Marshall Plan stimulated Europe's economy through a massive infusion of loans and grants. In Germany, over $1.5 billion was contributed to help build new roads, schools, and factories. As their economy rebounded, Germans acquired greater political autonomy. And with democracy came a call for the end of denazification. In March of 1948, three years after the war, the formal denazification period ended. Though some 100,000 people had been indicted, 
only 6,000 former Nazis had been convicted of crimes. 800 received the death sentence. Many former Nazis had escaped justice. I think in the end it wasn't a success, but maybe it was the best that could be done under that circumstances. For all of the people who were not brought to justice, the people who were brought to justice comprised a far larger number than is usually the case when dictatorships collapse. Eighty-five percent of eligible West German voters flock to the polls, and a smiling, confident Chancellor Adenauer arrives to cast his ballot in Bonn for the Christian Democrat ticket which he heads. During the balloting, hundreds of red sympathizers from the eastern zone of Germany had infiltrated polling places and had attempted to intimidate voters. Police had their hands full dispersing the rioting mob. In September 1949, four years after the war, West Germany finally had its first freely elected chancellor, Konrad Adenauer. In May 1955, the Allies dissolved the High Commission overseeing Germany. It had taken 10 years since the war had ended, but West Germany was now completely independent. Today, Iraqi sovereignty has been restored, but America still faces a daunting task in helping to secure and rebuild Iraq. For historians, the lessons learned over five decades ago echo across time. Nothing that was accomplished in post-war Germany of a positive nature, whether we're talking about justice or eventual democratization, would have taken place if the Nazi regime and its armies and the Nazi party had not been defeated and crushed. Perhaps it's worth thinking about now because the Ba'ath regime is not yet defeated. Its remnants are not yet defeated. They have not given up the fight. Although he has been captured, Saddam Hussein is alive and remains a possible source of inspiration for those opposed to a free Iraq. German radio broadcasts quickly announced Adolf Hitler's death, and his successor convinced most Germans that their leader was dead. His demise prevented many would-be guerrillas from ever joining the cause. There's no doubt about the fact that yeah, it, uh, it had a demoralizing effect upon people who might otherwise have tried to carry on with werewolf warfare, particularly if they had the idea that Hitler was underground and, you know, if Hitler had gotten access to a radio transmitter and, and could have broadcast to his followers. In Iraq, much like in post-war Germany, most citizens resent the presence of a foreign power. No one likes to be occupied by another country. And so the lighter the occupation can be, uh, the more sovereignty that can be transferred to the Iraqis, the better. As this sovereignty is transferred to the Iraqis, that we make every effort, and more of an effort than we made in Germany, to give voice to those citizens of Iraq who were victimized by the former regime and who are depending upon us to make it possible for them to tell their stories and to gain justice. The alternative to justice and the alternative to truth-telling is not just silence, it's vengeance. In Germany, resistance groups committed scattered acts of murder, sabotage, and bombings. But their movement never caught on because the German people, who had endured war for six years, were simply tired of fighting. For Iraqis, the future is still very uncertain. Without a doubt, the situations in Iraq and Germany are vastly different, but the world only hopes that they will share a stable and peaceful future. The preconditions for democratic governance in Iraq are not as potent as they were in Germany. But I want to recall how, how deep the pessimism was about Germany in 1945, something we often forget. That may be important to keep in mind as, as we're thinking about the difficult issues that we're facing in Iraq at the moment. At Mount Sinai, 1,200 years before Christ, Moses received over 600 commandments from God, yet religions around the world recognized just 10 of them. 
How do the Bible, the Quran, and the Torah interpret these laws, and how have they changed over time? Ten Commandments, tomorrow at 8 on H.I.